connected, we can uh, uh, keep our cameras on. Mm. Okay. Okay. So good evening and a warm word of welcome to everyone. Respected Principal Dr. Sister M. Rashmi AC, Patna Women's College, our eminent and esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Avishek Parui, Assistant Professor, Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Madras, Dr. Sehar Rahman, Head of Department English, Patna Women's College, Dr. Shahla Rehana, former Head of the Department of English, Patna Women's College, Professor Shankar Ashish Dutt, former Head, Postgraduate Department of English, Patna University, Professor Siddhi Verma, former Head, Department of English, Patna Women's College, Dr. Muniba Sami, retired associate professor, postgraduate department of English, Patna University, teachers and dear students. It is a great pleasure and honor for me to extend a hearty welcome to you all to the fifth lecture of the Reflections Lecture Series organized by the Department of English, Patna Women's College. Just before we get started, I request Dr. Seher Rahman, Head of Department English, Patna Women's College, to elucidate the purpose of Reflections Lecture Series. Over to you, Seher, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. I welcome you all to the fifth lecture of the Reflections Lecture Series. Especially Dr. Avishek Parui, I welcome you. Uh, you are the resource person for today's lecture. And I'm extremely happy to welcome Professor Shankar Dutt, Professor Siddhi Verma, Dr. Muniba Sami, who have been our guides and mentors. I'm happy to introduce our monthly online lecture series, Reflections, which was started to make the most of the new normal situation post pandemic. It is an effort at bridging the distance between the periphery and the center. Leading professors, intellectuals, and researchers from across the globe are now accessible to the students and faculty members of the Department of English, Patna Women's College that's situated, located in Patna. Uh, the objective of this series is to provide an opportunity to the teachers and students of the department to enhance their knowledge and to interact with the illustrious resource persons who join us online. Otherwise, it may not have been possible. Today's lecture is, uh, it, it's heartening to note that all lectures so far have been extremely successful, rich in content, engaging and interactive on relevant and new topics and areas of interest, both for students and teachers. And it has helped us to keep abreast of times by learning about the emerging areas of study and research directly from those who work on them. Today's lecture is, an important, is on an important emerging area of study and research, and I'm sure it would give a sense of direction to the researchers in the Department of English at Women's College. That's what I wanted to speak about reflections. Over to you, Dibina. Uh, Thank you, Sir, ma'am, for raising our awareness about the Reflection Lecture Series. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, I request all the participants to kindly mute your microphones. And now it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Avishek Parui, who is going to talk to us about the research possibilities in memory studies. Dr. Avishek Parui is a PhD in English from Durham University is working as an assistant professor at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Madras. He's the associate fellow of the UK Higher Education Academy. His, re his research interests include memory studies, cognitive theory, masculinity studies, and critical theory. He is the principal investigator at Center for Memory Studies, Institute of Eminence Center for Excellence Key Ministry of Human Resource Development, Government of India. He is the founding chairperson of Indian Network for Memory Studies. He is the author of Postmodern Literature's Literary Context Series published by Orin Blackswan. He is also the author of another forthcoming book entitled Culture and the Literary Matter, Metaphor, Memory, contracted with Roman and Littlefield in 2021. He has been the winner of the Minakshi Mukherjee Award for the best published paper in 2019, conferred by the Indian Association of Commonwealth Literature and Language Studies and Durham University Learning and Teaching Award as well. 
His work has appeared in the Routledge Encyclopedia of Modernism, Catherine Mansfield Studies, Literature and Medicine, Economic and Political Weekly, South Asian Review, and many places. Sir, it is such an honor and privilege for us to have you with us. And I'm sure that those attending this talk will take advantage of the opportunity of engaging with you. I once again extend a very warm welcome to you, sir. Looking forward to learning from you a lot. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, am I audible? Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're audible. Yeah, excellent. Uh, first of all, uh, many thanks uh, to Patna Women's College for inviting me to such a well-conceived uh, lecture series, Reflections, and, and what a wonderful name as well. And as Dr. Rahman was pointing out, that it's actually mm -hmm. uh, interesting how the, in, in the post-digital world has actually become a village where everyone can speak to everyone else. Internet has been such a massive instrument of access uh, and also uh, there's a degree of democratization of knowledge that you don't have to be somewhere in order to get access to certain kind of knowledge so I think that's interesting and very helpful as well uh, so i'm very honored to be here and uh, thank you for the very very generous uh, introduction so uh, i'll just uh, keep it as informal as possible uh, and interactive as possible uh, because what we are doing today is looking at the research possibilities and memory studies uh, as was very kindly pointed out by Dr. Devina, who also invited me, I must uh, thank her for uh, this as well, that I, uh, I work on memories. I'm a student in memory studies, and I, that's what my research has been about for the last uh, two and a half, three years. Uh, but we need to sort of define what memory studies is, and then I will spend a little bit of time talking about the idea of memory studies in terms of the definition through research. Uh, and how it connects to uh, various other disciplines. And then I'll talk a bit about the kind of work we do at our Center for Memory Studies at IIT Madras, uh, and also the, the Indian of Memory Studies. And I'm, I'm, I can see some familiar faces, so I'm hoping this is uh, familiar to some of you as well in terms of the work. So first of all, uh, what is memory studies? So as the very name suggests, it's a study of the processes of remembering and forgetting. And that's something that we need to pay attention to. And you will notice that I'm using remembering and forgetting together simultaneously. And there's a reason for that. There's a, a scientific reason for that, a psychological reason for that, but also a theoretical reason for that. Because when we look at memory studies, we sometimes uh, we, we need to pay a lot of attention, perhaps more attention, uh, to the phenomenon of forgetting rather than of remembering. Uh, what is unremembered? What is not remembered? What gets left out? Uh, what gets you know non-recorded? These things sometimes become more important psychologically and also politically uh, in terms of uh, investigating what is going on. So forgetting becomes a very key component. Uh, in memory studies, because forgetting is a very key component in the process of memory in itself. Now, there are two ways, very broadly speaking, I'm using some broad brushes here, uh, hopefully it will be helpful. Uh, there are two ways of looking at memory studies. One obviously is the more psychological, neural, uh, cognitive method of looking at memory. Uh, memory is a brain process, memory as a, uh, you know, as a mindful mechanism, as a molecular mechanism, etc., which is something we all experience, all of us are you know, remembering primates, uh, all of us remember and forget things. Uh, we, we have the mental faculty, the neural makeup, as it were, to do it. So there is that hardcore psychological neural molecular mechanism of memory. Now, obviously, we all know uh, it also spills over into some other things as well, which are more collective in quality. So we look at collective memory, which may or may not become history. Uh, we look at collected memories, which is different from collective memories. Uh, we look at social memories. So there are different kinds of dimensions of memory. Uh, and that dimension obviously has more aligned to, let's say, cultural studies or sociology or anthropology or some such disciplines. Now, the challenge in memory studies, which is also a reward, is to look at or investigate the interface between the neural molecular mechanism of memory and a more uh, and a broader social and cultural mechanism of memory. And we find that, interestingly, there were some very um, you know, interesting parallels in terms of how the mind remembers and forgets and how a collective remembers and forgets. So there is that uh, corollary, some similarity which we can you know, see. Uh, and there is a lot of evidence for that. And the book that I'm writing, it is actually finished. It'll be out in February next year, uh, Culture and Literary Matter, Metaphor, Memory. I look exactly at this convergence between matter and metaphor uh, and how matter becomes metaphor in the mind, uh, which then enters memory 
and how this can be both molecular in quality as well as cultural in quality. In fact, uh, one of my favorite books on memory is, is by a neuroscientist, a Nobel laureate in neuroscience, someone called Eric Candle, E-R-I-C, Eric K-A-N-D-E-L. I'm sorry, I don't use PowerPoints normally, so I'm just going to spell out the words and names. So Eric Candle has got this wonderful book called Memory from Mind to Molecules. So as you can see, even in neuroscience, we have this very interesting uh, bridge between the mind and the molecules. And the mind, obviously, as you all know, is also the social mind. The mind is also the cultural mind. The mind is also the political mind, the ideological mind, etc. So the mind is obviously a situated um, a situated engine, it must be situated in a certain context so that there is a mindfulness of that context. And of course, there is molecules, the molecular mechanism of memory. So that is the long and short of uh, looking at memory studies from a very broad uh, perspective uh, in terms of looking at the interface between the molecular neural micro processes of remembering and forgetting and a broader social processes of remembering and forgetting. Uh, now, as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, forgetting plays a very important role uh, in memory, because if, if we define memory in very technical terms, there are essentially uh, three phases through which memory happens. The first being encoding, the second being consolidation, and the third being retrieval. I'll say it again, uh, it's a three-tire process, uh, a three-phase process to be more specific. The first being encoding, the second being consolidation, and the third being retrieval, right? So encoding is where uh, the brain encodes information into a pattern you know, that can become an engram or whatever. And then that can be consolidated depending on the impact of experience. And depending on the strength of consolidation, it can be retrieved in the long-term or short-term memory. Now, what is interesting is we find that even in terms of cultural memory, even in terms of social memory, we are always encoding information. Every culture has encoded information. In fact, the very word culture uh, can be defined as an act of encoding, right? So you encode certain information, you, you give certain values to it. So every culture will have its own value system. And that value system will depend on the encoding process. So how are you coding something uh, into a meaningful uh, you know, mechanism? Uh, how do you make meaning around you? So memory is also an effort to make meaning, to make sense of the world. You know, you, you sort of remember something just so we can give names to things and interact with other people, other remembering uh, people as well. Which brings us to the other important point in memory studies, and that is, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to sip some tea while I speak. I hope that's okay. Uh, so when you look at memory, uh, we should not look at memory essentially and only as a retrospective activity, something looking back at the past, but memory is also an anticipatory activity. Right? We also make sense of the future. We can also anticipate the future uh, in terms of how we remember something. Right, So memory as a retrospective, as well as a prospective quality. So depending on the kind of memory we have, depending on the content of memory, depending on the quality of memory, the power of memory, we can also make sense of, we can also anticipate the future to a certain extent, what is to come. And this, again, can take place through a very uh, bodily neural process. So, for instance... Uh, learning how to ride a bicycle or learning swimming, for example, uh, you know, or learning how to drive a car. Uh, once you remember it, once your body remembers it, uh, it can perform those tasks uh, and, you know, take you to the future. In some sense, well, literally, the bicycle can take you uh, to a point in the future because you've learned how to ride it. Right? So there is that molecular neural quality about memory as well, which is what we call as a non-declarative memory. Uh, there's obviously also the declarative memory, which is a meaningful memory in a sense that which involves language, words, symbols, etc. So when a child learns language, when a child learns timetables, uh, then this, the same child can use that memory to perform a more complex tasks in the future, right? In terms of again looking forward to the future. Now let's just go back to the quality of anticipation. And one of my uh, favorite neuroscientists who work on anticipation and anxiety uh, is someone called Joseph Ledoux. Uh, L-E-D-O-U-X, right? So L-E-D-O-U-X, Joseph Ledoux, uh, a very famous scientist who worked on synapses, the synaptic self, um, who's worked on anxiety. His latest works are all on anxiety. And he has this uh, beautiful definition, which I find quite interesting. And he says, anxiety is a price that human brains pay uh, for the ability to anticipate the future, right? So again, I'll say it one more time. Anxiety is a price human brains pay 
for the ability to anticipate the future. Now, it's interesting how he's defining anxiety as, as an ability, right? because he's saying not all animals can be anxious, because not all animals have that very sophisticated neural mechanism through which they can anticipate the future, right? except maybe through a gut feeling or through maybe a bodily feeling. But human brains are obviously more complex, they're very sophisticated, uh, and because of which you know, the uh, frontal lobe uh, and all these different portions of the brain uh, are exactly how this mechanism works. Uh, and that's the price you pay to anticipate the future. So there is a loop-like quality about memory, as you can see. You remember something from the past, and that same remembrance makes sense of the present, and the same present can anticipate the future. So it, it's obviously memory as a very complex temporal activity. But what's interesting is we sometimes think of memory purely as a retrospective activity, but we now know it's actually more complex temporarily. It is retrospective, it makes sense of the present, and it also anticipates the future uh, in a sense that, you know, there is a certain kind of uh, anticipation, a certain pattern that you can make uh, to, you know, uh, hope for the future or wish for the future or, you know, draw a diagram for the future, etc. Now, so this being uh, the mechanism of memory, Let's uh, sort of take this model and apply it to cultural memory, a social memory, which is more of our domain in humanities and social sciences, because you know we are obviously not neuroscientists, but we do draw on some scientists' work, like Kendall, like Ledoux. There's another person I find very interesting, Antonio Damasio. I'm hoping some of you may have read his work already. Uh, Damasio's work is very interesting because he looks at an uh, emotion and cognition in very interesting ways. And that again, memory, we know that emotions play a very important role in memory in terms of the impact, the strength of memory, sometimes depends on the strength of the emotion uh, through which something gets encoded. Now, when it, when it use this mechanism, this model, this flow chart as it were, and apply it to, let's say, a broader model of memory, social memory, or cultural memory, or collective memory, we find that even there, Encoding plays a very important role. Uh, if you talk about culture, uh, culture, we, we, need, we can define culture as an activity. And it's a very uh, useful definition, I think. In fact, what I tend to do, I define memory as an activity as well. It's a bit like what Butler does with gender. If you make memory into an activity of becoming, unbecoming, rebecoming, uh, memory, which includes the process of encoding, consolidation, retrieval, but also forgetting, also slippages, also unremembrance. Memory is a constant activity, right? So culture too may be defined as an activity through which certain values are created uh, and also decreated and recreated, right? And that there is a constructed quality about culture as well. Every culture is constructed to different mechanisms, textual mechanism, emotional mechanisms, affective mechanisms, et cetera. And that's, we, that's why we have values in culture, right? Certain things are given values. You know, values can be tangible, like money. Values can also be intangible, like moral values, or whatever. But both depend on memory in, in a very big way. We remember value systems. We inherit value systems from our parents. We pass it on to subsequent generations etc and of course like almost everything in memory values can also be mutable right so there's a mutability with value as well what is good value today may be bad value tomorrow and vice versa right but it depends on remembrance at a collective level we inherit you pass it on and that's how it spreads there's also a contagious quality about memory at a collective level right you pass it on like contagion and you remember something and of course we can have more extreme examples of memory as contagion. We take a look at <clears throat> some, let's say, a big event, and there's a lot of work on flashable memory uh, that I'm very interested in. That the, some people remember something, you know, through a very, very effective emotional way. Uh, and how you remember, let's say, a big political event. It could be a violent event. Uh, it could be a personal event, etc. But you know, there is that contagious quality as well, which brings us to the other bit uh, that we have to mention in memory studies, and that is in their relationship with the memory, especially today, and technology, right? Because how we remember today is very different from the way we remembered earlier. And even I, I'm not terribly old. I'm in my you know, late 30s. But I remember when we were growing up, uh, the way phone numbers were remembered were very different. We, we should write it down on a piece of paper, sometimes remember phone numbers. So this was before mobile. I think our generation saw the transition from landline to mobile uh, quite abruptly. But of course, now we have machines remembering it for us, right? So it, it all it almost has become some kind of a prosthetic quality. You know, you have different kinds of smartphones and me reminding you of someone's birthday, someone's phone number, some event you did, you know, some years ago, and it can reappear, resurface 
in a very fluid way. So technology and memory obviously is a very important issue and a lot of research being done on the same subject. And what that has proved um, in a once and for all and is proving almost every day is memory as a, as a process of recreation. And interestingly, more and more scientists today are preferring the word reconstruction rather than remembrance when it comes to memory, right? So memory is not a reconstruction. You reconstruct something. And again, the, the whole idea of constructing something almost gives a textual quality to memory, right? Memory is a text, memory is a fluid process. In fact, uh, I mentioned Joseph Ledoux, and he has a very interesting theory, which is a reconsolidation theory, which says, that when you remember something, we don't actually remember the original event. In fact, what you remember is a last remembered version of that event, right? And that becomes a template, which then becomes the next template and, and so on and so forth. It, it's like an erasable disk. Uh, you remember something and the next it gets erased and becomes something else. So it becomes a very fluid process, a material process, a textual process, but also a mutable process. And what it also tells us very, uh, pointedly is a memory inherently is an unreliable process. So unreliability is something which is embedded in memory. And this is what I meant at the beginning, uh, what I said that we, we need to be a little non-dualistic uh, in memory studies in terms of not looking at memory and forgetting as ontological opposites, but rather as connected categories, cognitively connected categories. Because the moment you remember something, you also are simultaneously unremembering something, forgetting something. And forgetting becomes not the obverse of memory, but rather forgetting becomes a part of memory, a mechanism of memory, part of the mechanism of memory, at a molecular level, as well as at a cultural level. Because you know every culture will have events which it will keep commemorating, which will keep remembering uh, through different kinds of devices. It could be a museum, it could be calendars, it could be television programs, it could be political statements, etc. But equally, every culture will also have events and you know, situations which it will try its best to unremember, to wipe out, to forget, right? So we're again looking at oblivion and not necessarily as something which just happens, but something which is made to happen, right? Something which is very much part of the national collective cultural memory process, right? So oblivion very much connected to memory, not as the opposite, but as something which is connected, something which is entangled with memory, right? So we, we need to take up slightly post-structuralist perspective in memory studies uh, in terms of doing away with dualisms, but rather looking at as supposedly opposite things as connected categories, as things which inform and shape each other and influence each other, sometimes in very profound and problematic ways, right? So this is, uh, you know, the way memory works collectively, culturally, you know, you know, in terms of the brain, etc. Now, what are the research possibilities? That's what we are discussing today, aren't we? Uh, especially for someone like us, uh, someone like myself, for instance, uh, who comes at this from a purely literary studies perspective. Because I, I, uh, I'm trained in literature. I grew up studying fiction, uh, you know, literary theory. That is my domain, really. And then I've come to memory studies from that direction. So what do I have to offer? Uh, what, why am I interested at all in memory studies in the first place? And why is, more importantly, why is memory studies interested in me? Right, so in terms of looking at uh, someone with my domain knowledge, you know, what can we contribute? Now let's define a little bit what fiction is, uh, and why do we take fiction seriously, and you know, why do we take literature seriously? Uh, so what is fiction? So fiction, in a very interesting sense, may be defined, and this, of, of course, is a broad brush definition as a representative medium, a fluid medium, which combines reality with possibility. When you read a work of fiction, when you read a novel or a short story, uh, um, or even a poem for the matter, uh, it's a familiar world. It's a world that we know. Uh, it's, a, it's furniture that we recognize. It's nature that we recognize, or trees and chairs and desks and people and emotions, etc. But of course, uh, these are not real, as in these are not really people that we actually know in flesh and blood. These are situations we can relate to. These are situations which you recognize uh, without being real. So there's a very liminal quality about fiction uh, as a play between reality and possibility, right? As a play between reality and situationality, right? You create a situation uh, which looks like real, but it's not really real, right? So these are not people who you can meet in the street, but these are like the people that you can meet in the street. So there is that very similitude quality about fiction, which is very, very interesting. Now, what that means is, at a very technical level, fiction may be defined, or the novel may be defined, or any work of fiction may be defined as one of the earliest attempts at augmented reality. 
uh, created by man, right? So if we define augmented reality as something which approximates reality, and obviously the law of machines today, which do it, and we in our center, we collaborate with some of the scientists who work on augmented reality, XR, VR, lots of fascinating work done on that field. Uh, but of course, what we also need to be careful about is not to be too seduced by these machines today, because you know, we, we had something which was already doing it in terms of approximating reality, stylizing reality, defamiliarizing reality. And that device is called literature. Uh, that device is called fiction. You know, when we create fictional figures, when we create you know, real figures, and then we uh, defamiliarize them. So when you read a wonderful work of novel, a wonderful work of fiction, it could be a novel, it could be a short story, it could be a work of poetry. You know, but what we're essentially experiencing is an act of defamiliarization, and that's a very important term in literary studies, defamiliarize uh, reality, and that's something which, uh, you know, comes from the Russian from Alice Vodoshlovsky, but that is the essential work of literature, to defamiliarize reality. Now, the other thing that fiction does, very interestingly, let's say if we take a look at a political novel, you know, and again, that may sound oxymoronic, but actually it's a very potent instrument, a uh, political novel. A political novel can give you a public event, which you all know. It can be the independence of India, it could be partition, uh, it can be the Second World War, whatever it is. And it will have that as a backdrop, but then against the backdrop, we can have some human stories, uh, people who may or may not exist, uh, people who do not exist in normal circumstances. It may approximate a reality, it may draw on certain real situations, but then it'll fictionalize it, fabulate it, make it up, in other words. So in other words, fiction, the very landscape of fiction, the very template of fiction, it offers us this very complex combination of the real and the imaginary, uh, the, the, so the, the real event which happened, at the same time, the possibilities which may have happened, but did not happen. In other words, fiction becomes a very important instrument to articulate reality as well as absence. What did not take place, that can also be accommodated and articulated in fiction. Right? So that becomes a really fluid medium and then becomes immediately interesting in memory studies because if we are looking at memory as a play between you know, remembrance and forgetting what did happen with what could have happened, you know, that becomes part of memory as well. The fiction becomes very much an instrument to which that can be accommodated and articulated. The other thing fiction can do is anticipate as well. And we're looking at memory, not just as a retrospective activity, but also as an anticipatory activity, something which can anticipate uh, the future. Because if you know how to learn a bicycle, if you know how to swim, then you can anticipate, you know, you can perform it at any point in the future. And that can uh, help you process in the future as well. Now, fiction too, uh, good works of fiction, uh, they often have this open-ended quality through which, which trains us to anticipate the future. You know, a short story, an episodic short story, let's say by James Joyce or Kathleen Mansfield, one of the any of the masters of the medium, it always tends to have some kind of a, you know open quality, a fluid quality to which the anticipation is foregrounded. So fiction also becomes a training in anticipation and in very direct ways. So we can see how the literary as a medium, the literary as an ontology, is actually very close to memory in the way it works. You know, in terms of looking at the fluid process of reality and possibility of you know the fact and imagination, what did take place, what what did not take place, what could have taken place. So fiction becomes a very fluid form to which these things can be uh, very interestingly uh, you know, articulated. And one of my favorite theorists that I find very interesting is someone called Alan Palmer, uh, who has this wonderful uh, theory called shading. And he talks about shading in fiction. Just like you make a shade with pencil, you basically mix the white and the black together and create some translucent grayness. And again, translucence is a very important category. It's a play between transparent and opaque. It's a play between the fact and fabulation. So Alan Palmer's theory of shading is, I think, uh, especially in fiction, I think is very interestingly comparable uh, to some of the works that we are interested in memory studies as well. Now, just to wind up, so what kind of uh, research are we doing at our center in, in IIT Madras? Of course, there is a very strong uh, uh, cultural memory component. So we have different PhD scholars working on, let's say, Jewish memory in Kerala, uh, Anglican memories in India, uh, looking at memory from the postmodern historiographic uh, perspective, looking at memory from a child psychologist perspective. So different kinds of uh, research on in literature through memory studies is possible. Uh, but of course, the way forward can be more uh, advanced, the way forward can be more complex, can be uh, more accommodating, actually. So lots of work can be done looking at the relationship between literature and machines. 
looking at relationship between forgetting. So, you know, the whole idea of forgetting in fiction, uh, looking at novels uh, and short stories, which deal with forgetting, defamilarization. So a lot of Kafka can be read uh, using that. And also the other thing that we are interested in is to move a little, little bit away from the normal uh, models of memory studies, which is sometimes a little bit too reliant, too heavily reliant on the big event model, you know, some big political event, some big cultural event uh, against which, you know, uh, memory studies can be performed. Uh, it could be partition, Holocaust, World War, a big political movement, regime, et cetera, any of these things that we can think of. So rather than relying just on that, it's also interesting to look at memory as a slow process, memory as a daily process, memory as an everyday uneventful phenomenon. And we are very interested in that kind of work as well. Memory not as a big event, but memory as a daily process of osmosis, uh, what gets in uh, in a system, in a brain, you know, in the daily mechanism of life, brushing your teeth, going to school, talking to people, recognizing your neighbors, etc. Now what happens if for some reason that entire seamless mechanism gets interrupted. And you know, we have a paper coming up, uh, which we published sometime in December, where we look at COVID-19 as an interruption of the slow mechanism of memory, things we took for granted, uh, things we, spaces and times which we took for granted, faces, spaces, times, social mechanisms which we took for granted, suddenly getting interrupted, suddenly getting defamiliarized. And what does that do? To our slow memory what does that do to the osmosis of memory that we experience uh, in every day and I'm, I'm happy to send you the article as and when it's published it's coming out in the journal of memories which is published by sage uh, edited by hannah titler it is emerging from our center written by myself and dr Meredith Simiraj. so that's the kind of research that we are interested in uh, and of course i'm very happy to answer questions now uh, and you know do drop an email if you'd like to know more about memory studies but i think just to wind up the research possibilities in this domain uh, are many and potentially endless, which is also a problem because, you know, sometimes it can be a little bit too seductive. You know, we can sort of start thinking, well, anything goes in memory studies uh, because it is nothing which is not about memory. It's one of the most ancient attributes ever since uh, we have emerged in this planet. We've evolved through memory as a primate. You know, so our evolution has dependent on memory. So it is one of the most ancient attributes. So almost everything can be memory. Uh, you know, it can be memory of geography, memory of landscapes, memory of the ecology around you, uh, memory of obviously politics, but also memory of the body, memory of the daily emotion, memory of daily nest, memory of domesticity. So I think it's very important to be grounded in one's discipline, whether it's literature, or sociology, or anthropology, that could be the main stem. And then we can draw in different discourses and memory studies rather than just having a very loose idea of what memory is. Uh, because that kind of research may sound pretty attractive, but actually it, it just runs the risk of being non-solid, uh, which is also a problem uh, that we often find as supervisors as well in our center, because it's important to be located uh, in, uh, in one's domain. And then look at how that domain can um, engage with memory studies as a discipline, because memory studies is very organically interdisciplinary. It draws on psychology, both cognitive and clinical. Uh, it draws on anthropology, sociology, machine studies, culture studies, political science, and of course, literature, as I hope to have established by now. So uh, with that, I uh, will bring this to a close, but thank you again for inviting me, and I'm happy to answer some questions if there are any. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir, for enlightening our world with so much of knowledge. And now I request Dr. Richa, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Patna Women's College, to present the key points of the session. Over to you, Richa, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Devina. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for this uh, lecture. I mean, uh, we often use these terms like, I miss you, I don't remember this fact, and very, very loosely we use terms related to memory. And uh, now, uh, like today, we had to stop and uh, ponder over the issues related to memory. And uh, we, had, we, have, we are trained now to take it as a discipline and more seriously. Uh, so I might just, because we have limited memory, as you suggested, and as you said, so I might just miss on uh, a few points, but what I could gather, uh, with that like uh, power packed uh, lecture that you delivered, uh, I think that you uh, 
you have divided your lecture into three sections. The first section uh, dealt with memory as uh, a phenomenon, memory as a phenomena, which is um, which is both psychological. You talked about psychological memory. You talked about collective memory. You also talked about collected memory. And via that, you introduced us to the concepts of sociocultural aspects of memory, uh, to the idea of matter and metaphor. Uh, we also were introduced to the phases of memory that involved encoding, uh, consolidation, and and retrieval. And uh, uh, through that, we were introduced to the concept of culture and how culture, like memory, as it is suggested by uh, Judith Butler, that gender is a performance, both culture and memory, they are also performative. And uh, through that, we were introduced to the uh, concept of memory uh, and uh, like fiction and memory. Why do we uh, why do we study fiction and why do we need to study fiction? Uh, in that, uh, like we have always studied fiction, but here uh, we were introduced to the ideas like how fiction combines reality with possibilities. Uh, fiction is an augmented reality. It defamilizes reality. It articulates reality and and also the absence of reality. And uh, it is an anti anticipatory activity uh, and fiction therefore trains us to anticipate. And uh, that is how we uh, we connected the process of uh, encoding uh, in memory to the, the, the concepts of uh, to the concept of uh, literature. And that is why uh, we have immense possibility in research uh, in this memory studies. That is the third section that you spoke about, where you said that uh, this uh, research in memory studies, because memory is everywhere and we cannot deny that. Also like the extension of memory that we have in technology. So uh, we have immense possibility when we do uh, research in memory studies, because uh, we have to see the relationship between fiction and forgetting. And uh, you know that reminds me of another lecture that you delivered in an FDP, where you introduced us with uh, Milan Kundera's work of laughter and forgetting and uh, how uh, that uh, book itself is uh, something where we stop and we we are trained to remember things in different ways and we are also trained uh, to the politics of remembering and forgetting in that book we are introduced uh, with this like what are the things that we remember and we think that we will always remember something but we forget as well so uh, no, that that is a very interesting book and I would suggest everybody to read that book because uh, that will, uh, again, that will be a training uh, into this memory studies, if I am correct. Uh, then uh, you also suggested that in, as research possibilities, we can uh, take into consideration political fiction. And in that, we can see the politics of forgetting in fiction, like what are the things that we forget and what are the things that we remember. So uh, memory, because it is an everyday phenomenon, that is also an interesting thing. And that is uh, that is something where we can stop and that makes it a very postmodern study because we take into consideration all the small narratives, all the petty narratives of every existence and that we can take into consideration for our research which makes it very close to the cultural studies which is actually a part of cultural studies uh, as a possibility in research we also can like uh, like you are doing uh, you have done a research on uh, like covid so that means very contemporary issues because memory is an everyday activity all the contemporary issues can also fit in but that also is a dangerous thing because uh, that is where people uh, come up with uh, some ideas very loose ideas about uh, about you know research so uh, although it is every day but it is not loose because it is a very technical term and uh, memory studies looks at the technicality of uh, that memory and formation encoding and also forgetting and forgetting you said that it is something which is always connected with the act of uh, remembering uh, we also can uh, do some research in the areas of the politics of forgetting and because uh, it is interdisciplinary there are endless possibilities uh, in research in this area. So I hope that I have been able to sum up uh, what you said. I'm very sorry to miss uh, if I have missed something, uh, but uh, I, I hope you can understand because we have limited memory all the time. Uh, thank you so much for your lecture. I mean, Dr. Richard, I must say that was such an elegant analysis. I mean, it's actually better than what I said. Oh my and God. <laughs> I have learned so much in the sense how we connect to these different strands. It's very difficult to do. And I struggled to do it. And the way you did it, the way you brought in Kundera is absolutely fascinating. So I'm really honored with this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Dr. Richa, for presenting us the key points of the session in such a lucid manner. And now I request Ms. Apurva Paul, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Patna Women's College, to take up the question-answer session. Over to you, Apurva. Thank you, Devina. First, uh, thank you so much, sir, for this enlightening session that we had. And uh, we are in the most important section of it, that is the discussion round. And there are a lot of questions that are coming up now. So I will just take them one by one. Uh, Aska asks, uh, can we use forensic science as one of the methodologies to research in the field of memory studies? Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. I mean, I obviously, I'm not an expert on that, so I can't comment with any degree of qualification, but as a theoretical apparatus, it sounds fascinating because what it does, uh, the whole idea of quantum science as something which uh, looks at materials, uh, it comes to looking at the, you know, the, the production of possibilities from materials. It could be organic material, it could be inorganic material, but I think this connects with the relationship between memory and materiality. It's a very uh, interesting and very essential relationship because one of the uh, problems that we find sometimes, I, I include myself in this, uh, in memory studies, we sometimes end up being a little too intangible, a little too abstract, uh, a little too effective in quality, if, uh, if I may. Uh, and that's a problem. And I do it often myself. I, I should acknowledge it uh, at the very outset. So looking at something like forensic science, which is a study of the body, the study of the material, uh, and a study of the meaningful body or the meaningless body as it were, uh, is actually a fascinating uh, you know, way to look at memory in terms of what the material can produce and, and how that can count up, I think, uh, recognize memory, how they can count up objective memory or, you know, memory which is, you know, consumed as fact. Uh, because the whole purpose of forensic science uh, is to sometimes offer uh, altered meanings, right? Uh, sometimes offer meanings which are contradicting what was known earlier, right? So there is a before and after quality. Uh, there's a temporal gap sometimes, and there is always something extra, something new that can emerge. So I think what forensic science can do, it can really foreground the emergent quality about memory, right? something can emerge out of a study of the body, you know, the material, the organic, the inorganic, the, the living or the dead, whatever the case may be. And that can also very quickly become the connective model of memory. And I'm obviously using Andrew Hoskins' terms, uh, the emergent model and the connective model, a memory emerging from somewhere, some subject, some brain, some body, some, some situation but also memory uh, being connective to some other apparatus, institutions, et cetera. So I very much think uh, forensic science can be a very, very key category, a very key tool uh, in memory studies. I, I haven't done much research on that. I haven't studied much, but I will now. Uh, thanks for the excellent question. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is from Madhurantika Sunil. She asks, how do we see autobiography in the light of memory studies? Yes, I mean, autobiography is, uh, I mean, it's almost like a text of memory, isn't it? Because it's an auto, a self, which is writing, you know, the, the, you know its own story. Uh, so what that does, and I think, again, I should thank Dr. Richa, because she mentioned something that I completely forgot. And, you know, you should forget something in a memory studies session. It's, uh, it's some kind of an ironical tribute to the discipline. But I think she mentioned the idea of narrative. Uh, and I may have touched upon that without really... Uh, mentioning it, so I, I'm really thankful to her, because the whole purpose of autobiography is to narrativize the self, it's to narrativize the past, put that into a narrative, put that into a pattern, and that is a classic case of encoding, right, uh, because you're encoding a certain part of you, and you know, we all know autobiography is selective, biased, subjective, uh, there are certain things which the you know, writer will try to foreground, there are certain things the writer will try to you know, push into oblivion, I mean, we all know that. Uh, but what we don't sometimes engage with so much is how autobiography essentially is a process of narrative construction. You essentially construct uh, the self through a narrative. Now that process of narrative construction is immediately in a domain of encoding, right? You encode the self through language. You encode the self through a certain selection of emotions, through a certain selection of situations, right? So autobiography is one of the most fertile fields uh, of memory studies and any study of autobiography in terms of looking at what the subject uh, chooses to remember uh, and chooses to unremember also equally, because you, know, you can't talk about remembering without 
mentioning under memory, because every act of remembering is also equally and simultaneously an act of under memory, right? So that they go hand in hand. So autobiography becomes almost a textual practice, as it were. I and mean, that's my um, you know, cool definition, uh, but hopefully it's helpful. Autobiography is a textual practice of remembering. Uh, autobiography is a textual practice of encoding the true language, right? So I, I think it's, a, it's an absolute given that autobiography should be studied that way. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, Tasmiya, uh, she says that you told us about Lido's uh, theory and his theory is based on Pavlovian fear uh, conditioning. How is it manifested by humans as a social and cultural being? Kindly deliberate. Yes. That's, that's a very good question. Because Lido works on the amygdala, right? And amygdala is a very, that's a fear point, point in the brain. Although, we should be a little more careful because there isn't a part which is fear, there isn't a part which is memory. They're all connected. So the amygdala, the hippocampus, they, they are actually, you know, they're connected to each other in different ways. So uh, Ledoux's work is almost entirely on the amygdala, which is the fear, uh, the part, the, the part which begins to, you know, secret uh, even before you know what is happening. In fact, his theory is very interesting. He says, we can sometimes be afraid of something without knowing what that something is. The cognition can happen after fear because the amygdala can actually operate before the cognizant part of the brain. And that obviously is very Pavlovian. You're absolutely right on that. Now, what's interesting is, you know, we, we, we can't study human amygdala in a way that we can study, let's say, animal amygdala. So a large part of this theory is also taken from his experiments with rats. I mean, rats are things which are experimented with. But his claim that he's making in a book called you know, Anxious, uh, which is about the modern condition of man, which is about us, human beings. I think it's a, it's a bit of a sweeping claim, but it is interesting because what it's telling us is that the condition that we experience today, uh, you know, the constant consumption of uh, uncertainty, you know, the more and more uh, we become dependent on things around us as prosthetic devices, the more, the faster our lives become, uh, the more we have to engage with uncertainty, right? Uh, so the engagement with uncertainty becomes a daily phenomenon. So earlier, uh, it had to be some natural disaster, it had to be some big event, etc. But now uncertainty is part of the slow memory process, you know, every day of our lives, we, we happen to go through uncertainty, uh, which may or may not be you know, a calamity, but it is uncertain. So it's constant engagement with uncertainty in modern life, I think. That's what makes it really interesting. Because the only way to engage with uncertainty is to anticipate, right? So anticipation becomes almost some kind of a bodily mechanism to deal with uncertainty. And that connects very interestingly with memory, but also with false memory. And this is where it gets really interesting because uh, there's a lot of work done Society. It's possible to plant false memories. A lot of psychological work has been, especially, uh, let's say, on you know bad memories. So if you keep telling someone something bad had happened to the person, uh, it could be you know a bad food which is consumed many years ago, uh, and then you begin to make the person convinced that that did take place. Right now, that can produce real anxiety uh, in very similar ways. That may not have happened. It's entirely a false memory planted. But what that can do, interestingly, is to actually shape the future, right? So what you're doing is you're going back to the past and you're planting something false in the past. You, you tell someone, you know, when you were a kid, you had banana and then you threw up, you had a severe allergy to banana and you couldn't take it at all. And you keep telling that in different ways and you keep, for some reason, through some mechanism, you convince that person that, you know, that did take place in the, in, in the past. Now, what we see through experiments, a lot of case studies which can show us that, that begins to shape how the person consumes that food in the future. Right? So it is a very interesting relationship between anxiety, fear, and memory. And of course, all these things are very manipulatable and mutable in quality. I think the mutability of this is interesting because my first engagement with Ledoux took place many years ago. I mean, I read his work called The Synaptic Self, which is a brilliant work. I recommend that to everyone. It's got a book called The Emotional Brain, but also The Synaptic Self, right? where he says that uh, you know, real uh, transmission of code or transmission of information takes place in the synapses between the two neurons, not in the neurons, but between the two neurons. It's almost like a very postmodernist way of looking at cognition. 
that the whole transmission of information takes place in the space between the two neurons, that buffer zone, that liminal space. So I do recommend that very, very heavily. Uh, Ladue, his work on amygdala, fear, uncertainty, but also the plasticity of the whole process uh, of remembering, forgetting, makes it very, very postmodern, I think. So I think that's a very important, uh, I mean, I consider him as a neurophilosopher. I don't know if you'll agree, uh, because he's a scientist, obviously, but I think a lot of his work uh, is gravitating towards neurophilosophy in terms of looking at how we need to evolve, just you know, looking at the brain as a neural net, uh, but something which has an agency, something which is also social and quality, uh, something which is situated in a certain social mechanism. So I think that situatedness of the brain is very, very important. I think Ledoux's work uh, gives a very interesting pattern to that kind of a study. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, Divya asks, can we consider that our memory is somehow constructed by the state apparatuses? Yes, I mean, see, the state apparatus, obviously, I mean, I'm a big fan of Althusser. I think he's a very understudied uh, figure. In fact, if you read my book, uh, which, you know, I'm probably advertising it shamelessly now, I shouldn't. But, you know, in that opening chapter of that book, I spend a lot of time looking at Althusser. Because I think his work on affect is something which is not very well studied. Uh, there's a lot of work on Antuza as a Marxist philosopher, as you know, people, as someone who worked with the apparatus. But what's also interesting is how does apparatus are not just they, they would not be successful if they were just giving out rules, just doling out rules. They have to be affective in quality, not just effective, but also affective, right? They must produce emotions, they must produce a huge economy of effect. Uh, which will convince people, coerce people, uh, make people willing consumers uh, through that mechanism of apparatus. So I think uh, almost all memory that we have at a social collective level is mediated through this apparatus. Now, what's interesting, the, the reason why we need to revise all those a little bit today is because the apparatus will change. The ontology of the apparatus will change. So what was let's say the print culture, you know, in many years ago has now probably become WhatsApp or something else, right? You know, you just get information in your phone, which may or may not be true, but there is a controlling mechanism. There is some kind of a IT cell, you know, that's almost very Kafka-esque IT cell, isn't it? Some IT cell, some part of the world sending out messages. It's a classic Kafka story. But, you know, the ontology the apparatus has changed. Right. In terms of what is being bombarded out, in terms of what kind of information has been doled out uh, for citizens to consume. Right. So memory at a collective social level uh, is, has always been mediated by apparatus. You know? I think that's something which we must recognize. So I think it's a very good question. Okay, sir. Um, Farin asks uh, that she says that you have talked about the remembrance as a process of reconstruction that it gives a textual quality. Can you spread some light on some of the factors that distinguish this process of filtration by human mind? Is it different for a layman and an artist? Yeah, again, I mean, this is a very good question, but I don't think I'm qualified to give a, like, a proper answer to it because I think this is almost, uh, it moves in the terrain of uh, someone who actually looks at the brain Right, but there's a lot of, uh, I can mention uh, some people uh, that you might find interesting. Someone called uh, Eleanor Maguire. Uh, you should look up her work. Uh, she has a very interesting work on London taxi drivers because you know what this question asks is, is there a difference depending on someone's activity, right? A layman or an artist. So does the activity make a difference in terms of how uh, memory works? And uh, Eleanor Maguire's work uh, is on London taxi drivers. Uh, you know, London taxi drivers who, uh, by their profession, must know all the lanes of London, they mustn't rely on a map, otherwise they will not get the job, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a professional position. And what her work has revealed over the years is that how being in that profession, being in that ritual, being in that activity, actually changes the hippocampus, right? actually changes the inside of the brain in a very neural way, which is like, almost scary, right, if you think about it. But what that also means is, uh, and this is you know, why we need to take a look at culture very uh, carefully, because culture is a process of, we, we can be post-structuralists, mention that as a performative thing, but the relationship between the brain and culture is a bit of like leaking in, leaking out, right? Uh, the brain is culture and the culture is also brain. It, the brain leaks into culture 
So we have an artist producing a great masterpiece, which then becomes a cultural artifact. And the culture also leaks into the brain uh, in terms of the person consuming what is around you and then giving a shape to it, right? So I think this idea of the leaking brain, the, the whole process of cognition as a process of leaking, uh, the brain leaking information from culture and leaking out how you process information out to culture through paintings, through artworks, through literature, or whatever the case may be, is very interesting. And the one person that I would recommend to, you know, in response to a really interesting question is someone called Andy Clark. Uh, I'm hoping some of you have read his work already. Now, Andy Clark has this wonderful uh, theory of the situated brain, and he has this four uh, E uh, models of cognition: uh, the embodied, the extended, the inactive and the uh, 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 embodied, extended, inactive, and something else, I'm forgetting now. Uh, uh, embedded, sorry, embedded. So embedded, embodied, inactive, and extended. So the four E models of cognition. And what he's saying essentially is cognition is always an entanglement of all these models. There is this embedded quality, there's a brain, there's neuron, there's insight, there's an embodied quality. It must spill over into your behavior and language. There's an extended quality. It is also an inactive quality. So all these different qualities mixed together. So I think Andy Clark is a very interesting philosopher uh, in response to that excellent question. Yes, sir. I hope so. We can take a few more questions. And yeah, I'm maybe maybe two more if that's okay. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, Aditi, she is asking that can we consider memory studies as in skimmed version of id and super ego? A uh, skimmed version of e, as in the Eden Freud and super ego, yes, sir. Yeah, the Freud and Eden super ego. Yeah, I mean, Freud, I think, is important. There's a lot of uh, temptation today uh, to disregard him completely, uh, cut him off. And uh, I, I know of psychologists, neuroscientists, uh, certain kinds of psychologists, very ashamed of Freud as well, uh, as in, you know, they want to disown him as someone who's so sort of literary, uh, soft, and not scientific enough. But I think uh, we, we can't deny historical importance of Freud. I mean, we, we can contest about uh, the theoretical, you know, whether it's correct or not, looking at mine at that three tire level, et cetera. But, you know, given that what he did, you know, at that point of time, I think it's a very interesting historical significance because he was uh, one of the earliest persons uh, in my knowledge, of course, uh, who looked at the brain not simply as a material thing, but as a brain, which is a process of engagement with the world, right? Uh, so he placed a lot of you know, significance to symbols, for example, uh, to literature, to storytelling, uh, to language, right? So I think um, uh, without getting into the E superego bit, uh, I think it's important to locate Freud uh, and rehistoricize Freud uh, in a very interesting way, because it is absolutely undeniable that he was one of the first people in, in the Western world uh, uh, at least, uh, to look at the brain, uh, look at cognition, look at emotion, look at hysteria as a process of engagement uh, and not something which just happens inside, right? So the social is very important for Freud. Uh, the mechanisms of society are very important for Freud. So I think the ego and the id as the inside and outside, and these are connected categories in Freud as well. So I think that's an important, at least historically very important in memory studies today as well. So I would agree to that question. I, I think Freud is important uh, historically in terms of looking at a certain kind of model of cognition, which has been drawn on. And I just mentioned Andy Clark, but I think there's a lot of similarity. We, we can see that legacy you know, being extended, of course, revised, but also extended. Uh, we'll take the last question and it is by Asta again. She's asking how to overcome the loopholes like Mandela effect in memory studies. Yeah, I mean, see, the good thing and the bad thing about memory studies is that it's full of loopholes, right? And I think one of the things that we need to uh, recognize at the very beginning is that this idea of unreliability and uh, what we call aporia in literary studies, uh, the gap between meaning, uh, fault lines, if we use the geographical metaphor as well. I mean, this has always been there. I mean, this is very much a given in memory studies. I just mentioned false memory, there's Mandela effect, there's you know, pseudo memory, pseudo remembrance, or there are different kinds of things that one can think of. Now, what that essentially means is that we must look at the brain, not just as a neural net, uh, not just something which is a bunch of neurons firing away. Of course, that's there. But that is also happening in a social system. It's also happening in a certain social situation. 
which is also the making of the brain. And that's really interesting. The, the brain makes society and the society makes the brain. It's like a loop, really. So I think that kind of a model of memory, that kind of a model of the mind, if I may say so, uh, and then moving away from the brain and looking at the mind as a more holistic, the more complex, uh, as a more unmappable phenomenon, as a more unmappable activity. I think that's probably one of the key things in memory studies. So those of us who start research in memory studies, uh, we should not be scared of looking at false memory, uh, you know, pseudo memory, anything. We should actually look at these as research opportunities uh, through which we can find out more about how narratives of design, how cognition operates uh, at a neural level as a firing away of neurons, as well as cognition through art, cognition through mechanisms of different kinds of cultural activities, including literature, which is the you know, domain that I come from. Yes, thank you so much, sir, for so patiently answering all the questions. Though the chat box is still, you know, filled with some of the questions, I hope... Uh, I'm happy to answer those in emails, if you could just email it to okay, me. Okay, yes, sir, thank you so much, sir. I will ask, uh, we will just ask the participants to email you their questions. Yeah. Over to you, Devina. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it was uh, such an enriching session. And I'm sure that our brains are filled up with so much of ideas on memory studies. Uh, before we proceed further, I request all the participants to kindly switch on their cameras for a group picture. I request everyone to please switch on their cameras so that we can have a group picture. Okay, thank you, everyone. And now I request Ms. Deepika Tiwari, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Patna Women's College, to propose a vote of thanks. Over uh, to you, Deepika. Uh, just, just a moment, since we have very special guests also with us this evening. Okay, so should okay. we ask them if they have any yeah, comments yes, yes, to make yes, about yes, uh, today's okay. lecture and if they want to speak okay. something? Yes, sure. Hmm. Sir, ma'am, if you want to uh, talk about any of the aspects that were discussed today, you're most welcome. <clears throat> well, that was a very interesting lecture, very uh, illuminating. Uh, Dr. Parvi, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, I'm completely new to the studies, to, to memory studies. And... Um, I've learned so much from you today. Uh, some thoughts did come to my mind uh, when you're talking about encoding, encoding uh, uh, the encoding process of memory. And um, uh, what occurred to me is it's not only important uh, as to what is being encoded or what we choose to encode in our memories, but also how we encode these memories because uh, it all depends upon, it, uh, it depends upon the position that we find ourselves in, the individual finds himself or herself in, uh, in terms of class, gender, age, faith, uh, ideological viewpoints and so on. So uh, it's also um, important to see um, how we uh, remember. Uh, so I just, I mean, I, I the idea, I mean, I'm totally new. I maybe I'm, it's a very naive question or not. It's not even a question. It's just an observation. So uh, if you could just. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I mean, we all are new in this field, ma'am. So I think that's a very, very valid question. And thank you for that. Uh, it's an honor uh, that you engage with us so, uh, so wonderfully. But I, I can't agree more. I mean, the how of encoding is sometimes more important than the, the, the what. Uh, the, uh, again, this is interesting because it operates at a molecular level as well as at a cultural level, right? 
Uh, how does a culture remember an event? Uh, how does a nation remember an event? The collective, how does it remember that? Uh, how does it choose to you know, prune out some details? And again, how that does a brain or mind choose to do it? So questions of agency, questions of will, uh, questions of intentionality, uh, they all come into being, which then makes it very complex because then if it becomes political, the questions of ideology, bias, uh, all these things will become very, very big. And that's the domain of cultural memory, collective memory through cultural studies, but also at a molecular level in the brain uh, in terms, and this is something which you find in trauma studies quite a lot. Uh, in terms of how the brain or mind uh, chooses to remember or unremember the event. Uh, that can be a coping mechanism, that can be a healing mechanism, that can be some kind of a self-sustaining strategy. So I think the how of encoding is indeed as important, if not more, uh, than the what. So I, I can't it becomes a It becomes a political act. Absolutely. Forgetting to becomes a political act. Absolutely. At a collective level, it becomes a profoundly political act. So yeah, hence we exactly. have the politics of forgetting and you know the forgetting of politics. So yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Is Siddhi ma'am still with us? Siddhi ma'am, are you there? Even while discussing, you gave us several points and to remember, and uh, we are like we are, we have to now look up uh, Palmer Ladu. We have to look at the synaptic self. We have to look at the plasticity. So you have given us quite a task, you know, <laughs> after the lecture that we have to look up this idea of situatedness of uh, memory, and Andy Clark and so many other things. Shankar, sir. I've talked all my life. For once, it was such a pleasure to listen. And I've gained so much from it. <laughs> what is actually fascinating is, for me, is actually the idea of forgetting. Why people forget. And particularly in the area of partition studies, for instance, uh, families have actually forgotten things because not only because of the trauma that they suffered, but probably they were also accomplices to an act of violence, which they obviously don't want to remember. So, I mean, it's, it's absolutely a fascinating uh, area. And one of the points that uh, Dr. Parui mentioned is that memory is actually the last remembered version of it. So at any given point in time, you know, what is remembered will always be different from the act of remembering at another point in time. The way I remember something, let us say, at 7.30 in the evening is going to be very different from the manner in which I'd possibly remember the same thing at 7.30 in the morning. And it's, it's, it's fascinating, but what I really enjoyed about the lecture was the manner in which Dr. Parui actually structured, uh, structured his lecture. Thank you so much. We, I mean, I, I truly feel very, very enlightened. Thank you. So it's an honor. Thank you, sir. So I think now we can uh, proceed for the vote of thanks. So I request uh, Ms. Deepika Tewari, Assistant Professor, Depart Department of English, Patna Women's College, to propose a vote of thanks. Over to you, Deepika. Thank you, Devina. And good evening to all. I, Deepika Tiwari, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Patna Women's College, feel honored and privileged to propose a vote of thanks for this very intellectually stimulating mm -hmm. lecture. Foremost, I would like to thank Dr. Sister M. Rashmi AC, Principal, Patna Women's College, for giving us this platform and opportunity 
to organize the Reflections Lecture Series. I extend my heartfelt gratitude to our resource person, Dr. Avishek Parui, for taking out time from his busy schedule and grace us with, uh, with this very interesting session on memory studies. Thank you so much, sir, for this uh, very, uh, you know, for this intellectual feast. And uh, I also express a deep sense of gratitude to Dr. Seher Rahman, head, Department of English, Patna Women's College, for introducing today's session and for her constant guidance and motivation that helps us to take challenges in our department. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I feel honored to thank Professor Dr. Shankar Ashish Dutt, former head, PG Department of English, Patna University, Professor Siddhi Verma, former head, Department of English, Patna Women's College, and Dr. Muniva Sami, former associate professor, PG Department of English, Patna University, for gracing us with their presence in today's session and also for their very active participation. Thank you, dear teachers. So I graciously thank Dr. Devina Krishna, uh, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Patna Women's College for organizing and skillfully moderating today's talk. I thank Dr. Richa, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Patna Women's College for, uh, for her very impressively uh, uh, summarizing today's lecture and also for her valuable inputs. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I thank Ms. Apurva Paul, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Patna Women's College, for handling question answer session and for the technical help. Uh, special thanks to Nancy Padma, a student of BA semester third, for designing the flyer of the event. I thank Dr. Bhavna Sinha, Assistant Professor, PG Department of Computer Science, for live streaming the talk on YouTube. Last but not the least, I thank all the teachers of the Department of English Patna Women's College for their team spirit and to our dear students for their active participation. Thank you and thank you so much everyone for making this event success. Thank you so much. So, over to you, Davina. Sir, ma'am, would you like to say something? Sir, ma'am. So with your consent, uh, shall we end the meeting? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone, for joining thank and meeting you. this event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.